Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Sarah Makbool, with you at BTV World. In today's show, we're going to be taking a look at two important stories from around the world. One is, of course, the developing situation in Gaza and the Middle East as the genocide continues 10 months onwards, with reportedly more than 40,000 people murdered. It is, of course, important to note that peace talks apparently are underway. There is a lot of effort made towards this de-escalation, particularly after the um, Iranian reports coming in of a response um, as a retaliation of what what Israel did in Tehran, targeting, of course, the Hamas leader, and then, of course, also the attack in Lebanon. While, of course, this is something that Iran has said it is going to go ahead with, it has also claimed that the only way that this can be stopped is a de-escalation and complete ceasefire in Gaza. While, of course, there seems to be some sort of talks underway in Doha with regards to a peace arrangement that were not attended by Hamas leadership, but, in fact, were taken part by the UK at the US and counterparts and of course Israel as well as the Qatari leadership. What exactly will be the way forward out of these peace talks, whether or not there can possibly be something coming out of them and of course that we will be moving towards a peaceful negotiation end of the genocide and the removal of Israeli troops from Gaza is something that of course remains to be seen. Meanwhile, of course, Iran has threatened that if there is a failure of these talks or even if there is a delay by Israel, there is going to be action taken and so we're going to be of course talking about the developing situation in the Middle East with a particular focus on Gaza of course and the way that these um, ceasefire arrangements and peace talks are underway. That is going to be our focus in the first segment of the show today. Our next one is going to be taking a look at the issue of Kashmir and of course uh, we have seen that unfortunately this again is an issue that has been going on for decades. We've seen the people of uh, Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir struggle for their inalienable right to self-determination. And of course, this is something that has been going on through generations. And of course, many have also picked up arms while they talk about the fight uh, for their freedom. And so we have seen that there seems to be a surge of such incidents once again in Kashmir, particularly in the Jammu region, um, where we have seen that a larger Hindu majority now exists and whether this is something that is happening in light of, of course, more militarization um, within the valley by Indian occupation forces or whether this is something that is the culmination of the resolve and the peace that we have seen coming from uh, the people of Kashmir is something, of course, we'll take a deeper look at. But what is, of course, important is what is going to be the result of these actions. It seems that the Indian military forces have, again, beefed up their operations and security personnel and uh, the occupying forces within the area and the support puts increased pressure in an already militarized zone and increases and adds to the suffering of the people of Kashmir and takes away their inalienable rights to live freely and so we're going to be taking a look at the developing situation and what this means for peace in Kashmir and of course peace in the entire region for this and more as always in the studios I've been joined by senior analyst Raja Faisal and we've also been joined online by our guest former ambassador Mr. G.R. Paloch and foreign affairs expert Dr. Ishtar Emma, thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part of the discussion and joining us in the debate today. Ambassador Saab, I'm going to start with you with reference to, um, of course, how we see the developing situation in the Middle East. And what we've seen, of course, is unfortunately somehow the limelight has shifted away from the genocide in Gaza um, to the potential of an escalation in the Middle East and all out war. And while, of course, that is something that is um, an actual concern. Uh, what do you seem to think of the situation, especially in the way that countries such as the US, uh, France, Germany, or the UK seem to be responding with? It seems that they're quick to call for de-escalation. They're quick to call Iran um, to restrain itself from attacking Israel. Uh, but we haven't seen, of course, such urgent or quick responses with reference to the genocide in Gaza, which unfortunately continues. Uh, yes, Sana, uh, this uh, unfortunate saga, this unfortunate uh, history, uh, which actually started with the birth of Israel. I mean, I was looking at the history books today, and I found it somehow very interesting uh, observations. It appears that in the history of states that have emerged over the last couple of centuries, Israel is an aberration is an aberration which is born of a, of a historical aberration, what the Second World War was. It was the Second World War was a 
an aberration in the sense the the kind of scale of destruction and devastation just to recollect uh, the or uh, refresh the fam the uh, sour memory of second world war 75 million people died it means equal to several country now they have 75 million people out of that 20 million were military people and 40 million were civilians and how did they die very interesting and you can draw a similarity they di died because of genocide massacre disease bombing and starvation exactly the situation now in gaza the people who on whose name these people have created israel are actually perpetuating the same genocide the same massacre the same starvation hunger and starvation as a weapon of war the same deliberate genocide and 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 ethnic cleansing so i think there is a problem in its birth there's a problem genetic problem in israel so talk of peace really becomes hard uh, if you really are a student of history that would they ever bid for peace it appears difficult also at this time when you have a war maniac like netanyahu heading the state of israel so are the gang of this war maniacs i wouldn't say state of israel because there is a question mark now because of the moral uh, failure of the state the state has to rise up to the morals and values and standard uh, standards set by the human human civilization but they have crossed all the lines the most dangerous now is the attack on the settlers in the west bank the, by the gangs of settlers uh, of the uh, the uh, by the gangs of settlers of the palestinian villages they they just go burn their homes uh, pick up you young people just kill them since the in fact it's been going on but it's it has become more uh, it's good that there are some 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 statements coming up from the uk prime minister and some other countries have spoken about it but this is something again what i'm saying that the 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 hope for peace the confidence that yes some day there will be some rational uh, leadership of israel which will emerge and would see the day of the light would understand the logic of the disastrous consequences for everybody in that area it is not that only uh, if they perpetuate genocide if they perpetuate this this criminal massacre of the palestinians only one side is being harmed yes of course they are the immediate sufferers but in the long run for sure israel and its population israel in fact has lost this so many uh, so much of its international international support now directly coming to your question uh, whether uh, these talks it appears to me now these talks have become a a a a, a, a kind of an excuse for israel to continue with its massacre was the point of these talks is it just a lollipop to the uh, world opinion to the people who want to see uh, peace there let there let there be no peace that's why i think the hamas decision not to engage in this what they said in fact it was very prudent of hamas they said the, it, enough talks have been done there is a peace plan already which uh the 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 president of us owns it up that yes it is ours which we have worked out in consultation with israel they say go and implement it what are you talking about so i think by engaging more and more into talks giving this fig leaf uh or some kind of a, a, a cover to israel to continue with his massacre is completely ununderstood how can that be? that's an important point that you've raised uh, ambassador sab and i'm going to go to dr shak uh, with this as well because dr shak i want your understanding um, in terms of exactly um, what you make of this entire process of these talks and um, peace arrangement that we seem to be hearing about is this just a facade something that is being done so that it can be talked about or at least um, claimed that there is efforts underway or do you think that actual real substantial efforts 
efforts are being made in the direction of a proper peace arrangement, of a proper ceasefire, of the escalation of taking out all Israeli troops from Gaza. Is that something that the U.S. and other countries are actively working towards, or do you think that this is just lip service? Sana, thank you for having me. I think it, it's just a lip service because, you see, uh, the roots of this issue uh, are much deeper. And I think, uh, ultimately, a viable Palestinian state has to be established side by side, of course, with the state of Israel. And I think the, the ideal plan for that, eventually, some, you know, like, uh, days down the road, is the Arab Peace Initiative of 2002, you know, which basically establishes uh, an independent, viable Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. And also it guarantees in return uh, the normalization of Arab countries with Israel. I think that has been like almost 22 years. It was endorsed by the Arab League as well. So unless uh, there is a, a you know, peaceful pathway to two-state solution uh, in this uh, you know, pending Middle Eastern problem, uh, this uh, issue will linger on and I think it will provide non-state actors the pretext to raise the stakes in this conflict. And obviously, Israel, by its very nature, uh, is, uh, you know, up to exterminating the Palestinians, uprooting them from occupied territories. And we have seen there is a whole lot of history to it. And I think in the past uh, 10 months or so, uh, Israel has really uh, crossed all lines. There are two stands to it. One is that the Netanyahu regime was facing an internal crisis, both with the higher judiciary and also on charges of corruption uh, for him and his wife. And I think it is uh, a diversion that he has taken uh, using the pretext of October 7 attack by Hamas on Israel that has provided the pretext to divert attention from his own corruption and uh, dictatorial uh, you know, conduct in Israeli politics. And secondly, there is also this Zionist you know, issue with Israel. And Zionism stands for the expansion of uh, Israeli territory into occupied Palestinian territories and perhaps beyond as well. And I think as long as this uh, Israeli desire to expand and Israeli, you know, conduct in uh, exterminating the Palestinian people from their own territories. As long as this continues, we will continue to see, unfortunately, mayhem and tragedy with every passing day. Right, absolutely. And Faisal, I want your perspective on this as well, because um, this is the truth that we, we are about more than 10 months away from how it all began, and we have lost more than 40,000 lives, women and children, the elderly, and um, the horrors coming out from Gaza are, of course, unbelievable. Um, and so this is uh, something that, that we have condemned, and of course we have called Israel out on, but that's not true for everybody else in the international arena. And so while we look at these efforts and these calls for de-escalations and um, uh, an effort made towards uh, getting the situation under control, there is also still uh, support um, coming in for Israel, particularly by the U.S. saying that it is going to be uh, providing support to its ally in case of any conflict. And so I want your perspective then on the way that uh, this scenario can possibly evolve and the way that um, these countries have the potential to respond in case there is a failure of these talks. Yes, and obviously if we look at, uh, you know, the stance of the uh, Western countries, uh, of course, if we talk about the Europe, uh, Europe has been uh, crystal clear, majority of the European countries, they have actually uh, endorsed that the uh, solution should be a pe peaceful solution. And uh, many of the countries, uh, including Norway and then Ireland and then uh, many other countries, they have actually disconnected themselves with the uh, menace which is taking place in the, uh, from, from the Israeli side on Gaza. And that is the genocide uh, uh, which is being implemented uh, in there. But at the same time, countries like America, countries like America are actually providing uh, uh, Israel with the confidence uh, that actually keeps them going on and lingering on uh, this path. And uh, I'm, I'm talking about the weapons, the weapons which are being given to 
Israel by American side, that is the actual confidence which is being uh, given to them to carry out whatever they are doing and nobody is stopping them. If we, you know, look at the peace itself, how the peace would be come in, if we, uh, you know, check the both sides, Hamas wants not only a ceasefire, but that ceasefire should be for uh, uh, for a longer time, not just because, I mean, it, it as, as we always say, it did not start in October last year. It actually started way long ago. I mean, mm. every week, every month, we were getting bombs being dropped on Gaza, and nobody was saying anything about it. So they want a ceasefire, an actual ceasefire. But if, if we talk about, uh, you know, uh, Israeli side, Israelis, they want the total... Uh, uh, annihilation of uh, Hamas and of course in that pursuit they have uh, of course uh, you know martyred more than 40,000 of uh, innocent uh, people who had nothing to do with this war who were simply Gazans and who did who refused to leave Gaza and yeah. the ultimate uh, you know aim of Israel is that uh, eventually all of uh, the Gazans they can leave Gaza and they can uh, settle elsewhere and we can capture Gaza and mm -hmm. that's how the world should be knowing us for but uh, here is a fresh uh, you know air which i have been uh, uh, seeing and experiencing on uh, different uh, podiums be it uh, digital media or be it uh, social media elsewhere uh, it is not only the Muslim countries or a uh, few of the Western countries that are demanding the same Israel, but Israeli themselves and uh, Jewish people across the world, they have been coming up with the very decent statements in which they are saying that we are Jewish, but this doesn't mean that we can allow the genocide which is being uh, committed on Gaza by Israel and they are talking against Netanyahu and his designs, his Zionist designs. They are actually stopping them to do that. And this is the time when pressure can be imposed on Israel to of course reach to uh, a point where uh, we can see a peace deal. And very important aspect is that uh, as we have seen then that the discrete or clandestine activities of uh, Israel's intelligence agencies elsewhere, of course, uh, uh, in the Middle East, including Iran uh, in the recent times, that is actually going to escalate the whole, uh, uh, you know, uh, whole war. And this is not required at this hour. And as, you know, Trump has been saying that there must be an end to it and it should be rapid, it shouldn't be prolonged. But if we take the example of uh, current Biden regime, their design is so simple that they keep on giving arms and at the same time they keep on dropping, uh, you know, uh, expired uh, kind of uh, aid mm. to uh, Gaza and the bombs, they are of course selling them to Israel and that is their design. A prolonged war always, of course, is beneficial for uh, uh, Biden regime because they are minting money out of it but when it comes to of course you know saner world they are seeking a, a war to end and uh, i think uh, if sanity must prevail then we will be seeing very soon that this war will end right um and um ambassador sub i want your perspective on this as well because uh, while we talk about um what is happening it seems that there is a lot of pressure with reference to how the situation has evolved and there are reports coming in that benjamin Netanyahu himself is 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 interested in the end um, of what is going on in gaza and of course the de-escalation of the conflict in the middle east as well but i want your perspective of whether or not this pressure is real in in the sense to actually make him come to those terms because the rhetoric is just as harsh as we have seen before and it seems that uh, the situation on ground um, is also the same um, and and so in a lot of ways while we take a look at these efforts that are being made um, the picture on ground remains the same and the rhetoric coming in from Israel remains the same and historically we've seen that Netanyahu has acted in such ways has been of course um, 
very, very cruel when we talk about what has happened in Gaza. And so it seems that the world um, is also taking a look at the situation in terms of complete impunity, in terms of no consequence, in terms of somebody uh, who is a terrorist um, uh, as just another person of a leader of a country being respected in some of the biggest democracies in the world, including the US. So what exactly will be uh, the way that this, this, these two aspects can be reconciled with each other? See, unless and until uh, Israel as an entity is not penalized at the international level, and there are ways to do it. For example, uh, now it is beyond doubt that Israel has, at the highest level, all its officials, including the prime minister, the defense minister, as being now uh, declared by the International, uh, International Court of Justice, as well as the Criminal, International Criminal Court have are engaged themselves into genocide. Why and and they continue to be in power. So why should we not support that proposal which was made at the UN by uh, one of our envoys? That why should not UN consider the suspension of its membership till the time they stop this genocide? Likewise, the. Uh, U.S. support. Right, but Ambassador Saab, the problem remains that there may be ways to do something, ways to counter, ways to act, ways to give consequence. But is there a will also? Yeah, that's a, that is where I was coming to. All this, there are several ways. That's where our, 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 this was one of the tools that the international community has it. The problem is the lack of the will. And a total capture of the U.S. government by the Zionist lobby. And, you know, for, for our own learning, just it's better to go on to the history. So I was again going through the history. Uh, the Zionism is still exists as the ultimate, ultimate establishment which protects Israel while not being in Israel. They are everywhere. We can't name them, we cannot see them, but they are there. Imagine while Israel is carrying out this open day genocide, the US government announces $20 billion worth of military support. It concentrates its entire armada, it's like uh, nuclear submarines, its aircraft, almost a mobilization to the scale of when America attacked Iraq. So how to, where to reconcile, where to say? So I think ultimately we being, I mean, it's kind of a burden on you and on us when we sit in the public uh, forum like yours, we have to say the truth. America has to be sincere with the Palestinians. It has to be sincere with so, its own uh, values, with so, with its own ideals as a democracy, as a as a country which believes in in peace, existence, uh, mutual existence, which believes in the human rights, when that powerful country cannot is defying its own value system, its own ideals. I mean, one lacks the terms how to how to what to say about it. So I think. There is a need for the Muslim world, for the Arab world, to press on the U.S. Congress, to press on the buttons of the decision making in the U.S., which includes the media, which includes whatever levers there are, that they should make a sincere effort. They must tell Israel in, in un, totally in unconditional uh, terms that they have to stop the genocide. And then we can move ahead with whatever guarantees are required for both the countries, uh, that the, the Israeli community as well as Israel. So I think uh, essentially uh, we kind of trivialize when we say, oh, it's only Netanyahu which is holding back the, the efforts and he's able to prevail and not allow. Uh, again, Netanyahu is also being used as an excuse to continue uh, this genocide. 
the ultimate, it appears to me sometimes, it's a very pessimistic view which I'm giving, but I'm really kind of, there's no other option but to, the, I, I see no other light that perhaps they ultimately want to uh, wipe the Gaza of all Palestinian existence. And the Nakaba, as they've been saying. So idea is how to stop and prevent this second Nakaba of the Palestinians, which doesn't seem to be in, 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 in vision. These uh, peace talks, again, I would say they come, speak and go back. So what's the point? What's the point? Right, absolutely. And I completely understand the sentiment, um, Ambassador Sam. Uh, but Dr. Ishtiak, um, let me also come to you with reference to what we're discussing. There is, of course, um, the way forward uh, in terms of the kind of pressure or the kind kinds of um, dissemination that we've seen on social media and while in some areas it, it may be fading we have seen a lot of international support from the public eye from people at large from journalists from heroes on ground in Gaza who had made sure that the reality comes out in the front and and that we all experienced a genocide live on our social media pages but importantly of course to save their lives but i want your take also in particular in terms of what this does to the governments themselves particularly when we talk about the u.s now that the elections are also approaching um, and i understand such foreign policy issues have not been part of the way that reflects the voter sentiment in U.S. and uh, isn't something um, that is part of the presidential race. But in terms of this genocide, in terms of the kind of protests we have seen and the kind of um, action that has been taken by university students, by people at the Capitol, what exactly do you think will be the impact that that can possibly create on both the U.S. government and governments at large in the world in terms of the international pressure from the people to make something happen? And Dr. Ishtak, uh, with, with your permission, I wanted to add in as well. Uh, of course, uh, Ambassador Boloch has rightly pointed out that uh, America itself is in the claws of uh, Zionist lobby. I mean, uh, 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 not long ago, uh, uh, President of U.S., Joe Biden, he himself once said that uh, you don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. So it means that, uh, of course, the whole U.S. Congress is in the claws of uh, uh, the uh, Zionists themselves. So if this is the case, what would end the Zionist uh, control over U.S.? If we are looking in that context that, of course, uh, students are protesting against uh, whatever is going on in Gaza? I think, Faisal and Sana, thank you for asking me this question. I think, like, uh, I would, uh, you know, hesitate from analyzing this very complex issue from uh, a binary perspective. I think the uh, situation is far more complex even when it comes to the American politics or American foreign policy. Uh, you know, some countries have deep states, so America also has a deep state which has a interest in one conflict or another. And I think within uh, the American uh, presidential system, you know, there are voices, uh, you know, which are pro-Palestinian as well. Uh, there are uh, members of the senior staff of the State Department that have resigned over this issue. Uh, there are uh, not. Uh, there are more protests in American university campuses rather than any university campuses in in, in the Muslim world. Uh, European, Western public opinion, international public opinion, absolutely, America and Israel have lost. You know that thing in um, international public opinion. Also, in the, our times, is a very huge, hugely important, uh, you know, uh, uh, power block. Uh, in a digital world. So I think there are, uh, you know, like avenues that we need to explore. And secondly, I would also suggest, you know, like uh, there is no place for genocide or violence of any kind by a state actor or a non-state actor. And I think we have to go back, say, a couple of years ago, we, we were seeing winds of change across the Middle East and in North Africa, in the Gulf region, you know, countries were developing. There was a uh, reconciliation taking place, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Arab League. You know, so many things were happening, uh, Turkish relations with both the GCC and even with Egypt. So suddenly, you know, we have seen in the last 10 months or so, everything, you know, like from peace to war, from 
relatively integrative trends to disintegrative trends, and we need to find out the answers as to what has changed. And a story is not just one-sided. And I think ultimately, you know, like what, what is needed right now is basically uh, an urgent ceasefire so that the Palestinian lives are not lost. And I think all the stakeholders should get together for the immediate ceasefire. Second, I think uh, there are forces which are trying to provoke a wider conflict, you know, beyond Gaza and beyond uh, Hezbollah, Lebanon. And I think uh, we have, a, you know, we, Pakistan is not that far from Middle East or Gulf region. And I think we need to uh, uh, play our own part. We are an important country. Uh, we have played historic roles in the Cold War period and the post-Cold War period in partnership with America. And I think we should also try to prevail so that this conflict uh, does not conflagrate beyond uh, a limited territory right now. Second, immediate ceasefire, because apart from uh, anything else, you know, geopolitics uh, issues aside, what counts the most are the Palestinian lives. So they need to be saved because already 40,000, you know, majority of them are women and children have died. And I think we have seen this genocide taking place right before our eyes. Uh, and I think ceasefire first, and then uh, all parties should get together. And then, obviously, a, a pathway to a comprehensive solution, as I told you before, uh, that's only with a viable Palestinian state, this region will be peaceful. And people throughout the Middle East and North Africa and the Gulf region uh, and elsewhere will prosper together. Absolutely. Um, we're now going to be moving on to another issue around the world, of course, something that we've all been hearing about and dealing with and, of course, supporting um, for many, many decades now. And I don't mean to compare the two issues, Faisal, but, of course, this is another example of impunity that is being enjoyed by a state uh, with no consequence for many, many decades while the people suffer. And so uh, we have, of course, seen this struggle across generations in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir and something that has um, only just resulted in unilateral actions in even more suffering, more, more militarization, change of uh, the demographics of, of the area, and of course other such draconian measures. And so I want your perspective on what's happening on ground now, while we of course see a lot of reports coming in um, from India about what they're calling of course militancy. This is of course a struggle that has, uh, uh, has been going on for quite some time now by the people of Kashmir to achieve their inalienable right to self-determination. And of course we have seen that this is something that um, is, is part of their struggle as well. But in terms of how that actually contributes to um, their well-being and how it unfortunately results in even more action and stricter measures taken by India, what do you make of this current situation at the moment? Yeah, so now currently, obviously, the situation of uh, Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, it's, uh, uh, of course, once more we are seeing the uh, liberation uh, front or uh, people who want freedom mm. in uh, uh, Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, they are fighting for their right and they, ha they have taken up uh, arms once more and they are fighting uh, uh, against, uh, uh, you know, brute force uh, of uh, Indian rogue military that is there in uh, uh, a huge number. Of course, it is always being said uh, about Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir that it is the most militarized zone of the world. And that is why this time around we are seeing that uh, if, if the focus of uh, this rogue military was Kashmir and not Jammu previously, now the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, liberation uh, uh, army of uh, Kashmiris, they have started moving towards uh, the uh, Jammu side and Doda is the place where they are active once more and in one last month, uh, in whole month, they have uh, of course eliminated 14 of uh, the Indian uh, uh, side soldiers and uh, uh, on 14th of August, why it is getting more dire and dire for uh, uh, Indian side is that the moment when uh, of course, Rajnath Singh, who happens to be Defense Minister uh, of uh, India, he, along with his, uh, you know, all of the uh, military chiefs, they were uh, sat together in New Delhi and they were, of course, talking about the current situation of uh, uh, Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. At the very hour, 
uh, one of the uh, captains of uh, Indian rogue military uh, in Jammu, uh, Deepak Singh, he got killed as well by uh, the very freedom fighters of uh, uh, Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, this is getting more dire and dire. And what Indians are coming up with, they are only coming up with uh, the same old uh, narratives and that is to of course blame Pakistan for it. And that has nothing to do with, uh, you know, Pakistan has always maintained that it has nothing to do with Pakistan. Of course, it is a self-created problem by the Indians and people uh, when they will see that their country is occupied by uh, illegal uh, Indian occupation, then of course they will fight against it. And they, that, is, that is what people of Jammu and Kashmir are doing. And this is at uh, the full fledged and uh, now we will see that in coming days the situation uh, might uh, sharpen up itself more and more and we just need to wait what kind of response uh, India is coming up with but at the same time we know that there are many places in Jammu uh, from where Muslims youths they are being captured and they are being interrogated by the Indian military uh, in the Indian military cells and whoever gets killed or in, in, in these interrogations, what they, one, what they portray is that they simply drop their uh, bodies somewhere and they shoot the bodies and they claim that as if they have, uh, you know, killed uh, freedom fighters. Yeah. This is not the case and, uh, of course, they are uh, uh, only having a spree of uh, extrajudicial murders and one extrajudicial murder would more attract more and more people uh, towards the asking right. freedom with the help of a gun. Absolutely. Um, and Basra Sahib, I want your perspective on this as well. Um, when we talk about the struggle uh, that the people of uh, illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir um, have had to go through for quite some time, and of, co of course that runs through generations. Um, and while we've of course seen that the, they are undeterred, their resolve remains strong, we still of course see that despite that, there has been a number of um, actions that have been taken by India with reference to what is going on, of course, 2019, the unilateral actions of August 2019 are just one example. Then, of course, change in demography, militarization, and again, all of this with um, uh, no consequence. And so I want your perspective then on when we talk about this narrative coming out from within India of militants, um, that, the, that the people of uh, Kashmir who are fighting their just struggle are called militants. How exactly do you look at this and whether or not um, there is the, the kind of uh, distinctions that are being drawn um, and the parallels that are being drawn between what is going on within Kashmir to other militant organizations around the world? Uh, so there's a difference between the militancy in Kashmir and other militants or non-state actors, as is being said. Obviously, India, for its own purposes, is trying to equate the uh, the freedom fighters in Kashmir to the militants as being known in the world, like those non-state actors. Uh, so I think, and also the UN uh, Charter itself gives right to the people under foreign occupation uh, to use all means possible for their freedom. So I think from legal point of view, international law point of view, even that uh, does not uh, make them uh, to be defined as uh, India is doing uh, is doing as terrorists. Uh, also, that uh, Kashmiri struggle has been, uh, of course, there was a, there were different ups and downs of militancy, uh, but I think it has a very strong uh, political component. Uh, but the problem is that when uh, when uh, when uh, Indian government has completely banned any political expression of their will of the people of Kashmir, then obviously what we see on the screen or on the, in the news is what is being done through their militant wing of their struggle. So I think it's India has to be blamed for what is happening in Kashmir. Obviously starting off with, with, with denying them the right uh, as enshrined in the UN Security Council resolutions of uh, their free choice as to they want to join Pakistan or they want to join India. One second, then uh, even the nominal autonomy they had, they have that has been taken away. Uh, even and that is actually always been saying that it is an attempt to completely obliterate 
the cultural identity, the ideological uh, identity and ethnic identity of Kashmiris in Kashmir. So it is yet another kind of genocide when you change the history of the people, when you uh, curb the use of certain language, when you curb, when a country curbs the use of even Kashmiriyat, and that is even mm, understood to be a, a seditious uh, term by the, by, by the occupying force. So I think India, by all its definition, is in the illegal occupation of Kashmir. Uh, it's not me, you, or Pakistan saying it, but that is what the UN resolution says, a resolution which was passed at the behest, at the request of India itself. It was India which went to the UN and took the matter and took the matter to the UN for mediation, for applying the international law. And also that it was not only up to that, at several occasions, no less than the prime minister, the then prime ministers, prime minister and prime minister, as uh, Nehru and other his successors have been saying one way or the other that Kashmiri will be given their rights of self-determination. So I think... Unfortunately, the only words that we've been hearing, but Dr. Ishtiaq, I want your perspective on that as well, particularly in terms of the so-called militancy in occupied Kashmir. In light of, of course, what Ambassador Saab just highlighted is legal um, in terms of uh, any anyone under occupation, but also in terms of uh, what we've seen is that there seems to be lack of any body, organization, country, or at any level um, to take action against violation of international law. While, of course, we have the UNSC resolutions, they have been violated, nothing has been done about it. Um, and so if we are in a scenario where there seems to be um, no real value of international norms and traditions, what then can um, any nation, um, any community do that is under occupation? This is uh, from me. Yes, yes Dr. Star. Go ahead. Ah. Yes, Sana, you see, the thing is uh, that, uh, you know, the, the peace process between India and Pakistan or the, you know, peace negotiations under the UN Security Council resolutions, many times, you know, there have been possibilities, different kinds of possibilities that the two sides, India and Pakistan, will agree and obviously putting Kashmir in the center. Uh, we had composite dialogue for a number of years. Kashmir was on top and there were seven other issues. Since 2019, there is a qualitative shift. As Ambassador Saab was just mentioning, you know, like there is this ethnic, uh, you know, the identity question right now. Because what the Indians have done is by annexing it and then dividing it illegally in violation of the UN Security Council resolutions, they are changing the demographics of Kashmir, uh, marginalizing the uh, distinctive religious, ethnic, and historical identity of the Kashmiri people. Uh, there is a deliberate move, actually, to delimit de the territories and to absorb the new citizens which come from India. Uh, yeah. Right, absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Ishtiaq, for joining us. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you for being part of the debate. Thank you, Mr. J.R. Baloj, for being part of the debate as always, and of course, Sir Faisal, for being part of the discussion as well. That's all that we have from the debate. We'll now see you on Monday.